Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. We're back again, Dotsy and me. (laughs) Hi. Uh, Wow. On December 9th, Switch for Good did an amazing guerrilla campaign that was just really, really impressed me, Dotsie. And I actually got a lot of emails from friends of mine saying, congratulations, Alexandra. And I had to tell them, I don't deserve any credit. I am a co-host of the Switch for Good podcast and I support every single thing they do, but I am not the mastermind behind it. It is Dotsie's baby and she is the, uh, the founder and president and basically you mastermind we have an amazing team behind a lot of the campaigns and this one was incredibly um creative please tell everybody what happened why you did it and um yeah what kind of effect it's had yeah, well, you know, I like to call what we did call, I like to call it brandalism, uh, which I didn't make up that word, but that's, that is, uh, it's, it's basically when you, uh, it's just, it was a spoof campaign. We posed as Starbucks saying, uh, you know, exposing uh, their corporate greed in order to bring a very important issue to light that wouldn't generally get any news coverage otherwise. That's why um, that, that, that's why anyone would do a, a spoof campaign or a brandalism campaign. We actually did it alongside the Yes Men, which those of you who are listening to the podcast, you can certainly look them up. They have a 2003 documentary uh, and they're also at um, yesmen.org and they are kind of spoof campaign specialists. And we got a hold of them. And we said, we have this idea, uh, might you work alongside us? And, and they were a blast and I, we learned so much. But yeah, basically last Thursday, the, that, that whole incredible team that you just mentioned, uh, and I huddled in my dining room at 7 a.m. after launching pretty much one of the biggest, you know, public-facing, behavior change-facing type of campaigns uh, in our organization's history. So we pretended to be Starbucks, and we blasted a press release claiming the brand was dropping its non-dairy upcharge and placing it on beverages ordered with cow's milk. (laughs) And we called it the Justice Cup campaign. And we did it, yes, to bring mass media awareness to the dietary racism that is inherent in upcharging for non-dairy milk. And what, what, what did I just say? What, 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 what? Well, 70 to 95% of BIPOC folks can't digest dairy at all. It makes them really sick. People of color are very disproportionately affected by this upcharge that is upheld by a white majority. It's also very alive and well, as we know, Alexandra, in our um, school system in the United States where a cow's milk is forced on every child, whether it makes them sick or not. So um, I think a difficult choice must be made for every Starbucks purchase uh, and pay the toll or pay you know, the health consequences. And that's not fair. So we sent it out and uh, Business Insider picked it up, uh, Food Insider picked it up, um, uh, Bloomberg picked it up, Pop Sugar picked it up. Uh, it was, the stunt was blasted all over Yahoo News. Um, but as the day unfolded and we did the reveal. Um, well, hold on, I just want yeah, to say, you yeah. not only issued a press release, you, a commercial, uh, a Starbucks commercial about the Justice Cup, you had produced one that looked, that was so 
well done, well executed. It looked like a real commercial from Starbucks celebrating. It was believable, very much so. And and for, for those that maybe saw a tiny piece of this news or none of this news at all, on switchforgood.org, right on the homepage, you can click a pink button that, that is, explains the whole campaign. And there you can see the launch video, our reveal video, different assets, other, just, just about the whole campaign. So, you know, you can certainly go have a little visit, but as the, as the day went along and we did the reveal, you know, the, of course the, the news outlets that were pumped were, were not happy specifically Bloomberg, uh, but we, uh, there were some really incredible opinion pieces um, that were written by, um, one was by Surge Activism and one was by TAG24. And they, they, the, both of those articles are also on the page um, on switchforgood.org. And they just did a really outstanding job of actually explaining the dire issue at hand, which was the whole entire point of this. Um, we know that Starbucks you know, knew and was freaking out because they were, they were hand calling all of these news outlets. You called the next day. I did. And they, they had as they read to you uh, why their plant milk is more. So they claim it it costs more, but that's a, that's a whole nother conversation. They make their own plant milks, every single one, except for oat milk. So they make their own soy, they make their own coconut, they make their own almond. And just um, I'll just say this. If it's if it's if they're truly charging the customer for what they are charged for, um, then why is it is it eighty cents for a tall with soy milk, eighty cents for a grande with soy milk, and eighty cents for a vente with soy milk? Uh, <laughs> so, um, so we're we are we are. This is just the beginning. Um, we're we're doing. Um, we're going to be doing, we're, we're pushing them a lot in, in a variety of different ways that, you know, all of you hopefully will stay tuned and we'll be talking about some on the podcast and, and certainly if you, if you follow the nonprofit. So it was a, it was a fun day. It was an ex- exciting day to, to, to end the, the Bloomberg, um, kerfuffle that I just mentioned was the reporter, you know, the reporters don't like to get pumped. And so he wrote a, a really rude email. Uh, but the, the part that I found humorous was, you know, he said, oh, you know, you guys are awful. You know, you punk the media. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but he said, so Bloomberg will not be covering Switch for Good anymore. And I wanted to write back and say, <laughs> oh no, that'll suck so bad because of all the wonderful news that you have given us over the last two and a half years about these really important issues. You know, it's like, well, they don't like it because they write an article based off a press release instead of actually calling somebody at exactly. Starbucks. Um, it makes them look like the uh, non-professional journalists that they are. Um, Dotsie, da- da- I just wanted to, to say that I, I think it was brilliant because, in, because Starbucks had to deny that it wasn't taking this upcharge off, mm-hmm. it made them look racist actually and uh it made them look stupid so that was so brilliant of you that in their denial they 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 was sort of a sheepish denial um yeah i think that's the best that's the best form of brandalism because you you never want to you know directly i don't think you know say oh you know starbucks is horrible people look what they're doing you just expose what they should be doing which if they did, they would look like geniuses and they would look like people that actually really care about BIPOC folks, people that actually really care about the environment, people. <laughs> and it, it really, I can't take any credit. It's a page out of the Yes Men playbook in their 2003 documentary. They pose as the Environmental Protection Agency. And if you haven't seen the documentary, you would absolutely love it. And they, they, they go around to different events uh, posing as them and, and and delivering the message that the EPA is is now going to actually take a big stand against corporate interest and, and, and corporate greed, and that the EPA is going to be doing all of these wonderful things. I mean, it, they really go into great detail. So then at the end, the EPA has to come say, that's not really us. We're still going to be in the pockets of corporate and we're still, <laughs> we're not going to actually do anything. Uh-oh. So that's kind of the point, right, is to not make them look bad unless they don't make a change and then they look bad. So that's, yeah, I think that's the tactic. Well, Dottie, thank you for doing that. And everybody go to the Switch for Good pages. The Starbucks number there, can they still call 
Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's on. The, yeah, we have it at the bottom of the Justice Cup campaign. But if you just go to the homepage, you'll you'll see where to click to learn about the campaign. But yes, it definitely is still there. Okay, I can, can give it call. to them. It's 800-782-7282. and just tell them that you disapprove of the upcharge. You think it should be taken off uh, the upcharge for non-dairy milks and if they need to make more money because they're losing so much money on those expensive plant milks then just put the upcharge on the 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 cow's milk for all the the price that we pay for the environment for um yeah having the animal ag industry and they know there there was there was an article that came out months ago maybe three or four months ago where starbucks admitted they said that dairy or cow's milk um was their largest environmental challenge as a company oh right out of their own mouth so, <laughs> you're helping them <laughs> you need to put the upcharge oh. on the cow's milk sounds like to oh me anyway. well today our guest is about mm. as much of a rebel as you are Dotsie. so <laughs> she's a badass this one i <laughs> uh, can't wait to dive in well today we are so honored to have the first female overall winner of Race Across America on the show. You know, but that's only her most recent claim to fame. Leah Goldstein is basically blind to limits. At just 17, she won the Bantamweight Kickboxing World Championships. In her 20s, she became a Krav Maga specialist and the first female elite commando instructor for the Israeli Defense Force. In her 30s, she became a professional cyclist and survived a crash that literally tore her face off. Undeterred by doctors sentencing her to life without racing, Leia recovered and found her stride in ultra endurance cycling events. And this past July, she made history by winning Ram outright, cycling 3000 miles across America in 10 days during a record heat wave crossing the finish line in over 16 hours ahead of the first male finisher. (laughs) Her superpower, you're wondering? Basically tell her she can't and she will. Leah, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I have to tell what will probably end up being a few personal stories about you on this show. Okay. (laughs) Uh, Because when you were in your thirties and you became a professional cyclist, you were one of the best. I raced alongside you and competed against you for, for, for many years. Mm -hmm. I was beginning my cycling career and my first vivid uh, memory of you was I went back and I I think it was probably, it must have been 2001 because it was Altoona and we were, you were on 800.com professional cycling team. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I was uh, just guest riding for you guys. You, you, you needed an extra rider and I wasn't on a team, a professional team yet. And so I came and guest rode for you guys and I was starstruck at the, the entire team. And my job was just to uh, be a domestique and help you and a few of the other women get to the finish line first. It was like my only job. And I remember, and you remember too, I mean, that there were some brutal stages uh, at yeah. that at Al- Altoona stage. Right? Yes. I mean, yeah, they, for sure. They got yeah. some steep hills back there. Yeah. <laughs> and we were very far into a stage. Uh, it, I mean, probably almost, you know, maybe 10 K or so from the finish. And I was, the wheels were coming off. Literally, I was losing my mind and you were doing well in GC. So you really shouldn't have been bothered with me or my pity party that I was having. Um, But I remember you coming up to me alongside of me and I I was, you know, kvetching and whimpering and just didn't know how I was going to, you know, continue going. And I remember you saying something along the lines of just, Dotsie, you've got this, get on my wheel. And in cycling, as we know, I'm almost feeling like I'm going to tear up because yeah. it was just one of those very short, very simple moments that someone just basically said, I've got you. And you didn't need to have me. I needed to have you because I was the domestic. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh 
my God. And I, to this day, I still use the, to some friends, like get on my wheel, even if we're not on a bike, because right. you and I know that that just means basically 40% less effort for sure. And yeah. I, I just slid on your wheel and I think you eventually dropped me, of course, I'm sure, but <laughs> I just, I just felt so cared for and so safe. And I had to tell that story because you have these incredible accolades, but you are one of the kindest humans I've ever met as well. well thank you. I'm very humble. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, so, I've been on the other side too, where I was in the same predicament, right? You know, and when somebody's there to help you, it means the world and you don't forget that, right? And you don't forget, how, you know, your struggles. Because I mean, I struggled in pro cycling. When I went into pro racing, I was 30 years old and, you know, the federation basically he told me I was too old. I was too big to be a climber, too small to be a sprinter. I basically missed the boat. So I was basically on my own for many years, um, you know, struggling, just not getting onto projects and stuff. So it was a, basically a one woman team, you know, to prove, yes, I'm good enough, even at 30 years old, which of course is young for us right now. Right. But back then like, I was like a grandma, you know what I mean? I go, come on. <laughs> You know, so I mean, I've had exactly the same situation as you with me. It was Clara Hughes who helped me one time. Like she's an Olympian, right? And we were in Hewlett Packard. It was like 40 degrees outside. I ran out of water. I'm a complete nobody. She looks over at me. She goes, you want one of my bottles? And I was like, oh my God, from everybody. And I said, no, because I was too embarrassed, but I wanted it so bad, right? But I didn't take it from her, but I'll never forget that kindness, right? And, you know, even of who she was. And so you remember those kind of things and you want to yeah. be that. That's a role model that you want to look up to and, and be like that, right? And I think it's important, right? You got to help each other because one day you'll need the help. So it works both yeah. ways, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, meant wrapping that full circle and. Yeah, Clara's amazing yeah, <laughs> in so many ways. Um, oh my gosh, I, I remember meeting you and finding out that you um, you had been in the uh, Israeli army, Israeli dis defense force, but I don't think I knew until I was doing research for the show that you were the first female elite commando instructor. Correct. So you, you, you became a Krav Maga specialist. And then I, I know that in, in Israel, you everyone joins the army for a period of time, right? A certain Correct. amount of time. Okay. Yes. Male and female. Correct. Yes. Women have to, women have to do two years and men have to do three years, whether you like it or not. But Leah, okay. my understanding is you were living in Canada at the time and you chose to go in. you were not drafted. Correct. Because if you back up a little bit more, when I was seven years old, you know, I wanted to be James Bond, right? <laughs> so I knew that I would go back to the Middle East and do my service and work for some form of intelligence. That was my goal from as young as I could remember. And that's why after I graduated, well, after I won the world championship in kickboxing is when I completely retired. And I had a lot of opportunities open to me, but I had, you know, my goal of, you know, going back to Israel, doing the service and hopefully get into, you know, some form of intelligence. And you did that. Um, I did. <laughs> can, can we can we go back to to your childhood bef when you got into taekwondo and kickboxing and share with us a little bit about why you got into those um, those martial arts because it was a little more than just because of you wanted to be James Bond. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I got into Taekwondo because I was bullied, right? I mean, you know, I spoke with a lisp. I had a learning disability. My left leg was growing at a faster rate than my right leg. So I, um, I walked with a limp. I was an easy target, right? You know, so every lunch hour I was chased by, I call it the Jason gang, a group of eight boys, me and my best friend, Matthew, you know, and I didn't tell the teachers because back then, you know, you're told not to tattletale. I didn't want to tell my parents because, you know, we were new immigrants. They were struggling. So so, you know, my solution, my salvation was, you know, flipping the channel, looking for Gilligan's Island. This is a show that I got to watch when I was a kid. And I came across Bruce Lee and he was fighting like five, 10, 15 people. And I get super excited. I go, wow, damn, I only have to fight off eight, you know? So then I just begged my mom, I want to learn whatever that guy is doing, right? And he was small, petite. He's like my size, right? You know, and that's kind of how the Taekwondo, um, I got into Taekwondo mainly because of that is being wanting to be, to defend myself. Right. And it just kind of escalated because when I got into Taekwondo, I excelled very fast. You know, by the time I was 12, I was a junior national champion, second degree black belt. And part of the reason was, is because my father was the national champion of sport of boxing. 
And when I was a child, you know, I didn't grow up watching football, hockey, soccer, what most North American kids watched. I watched boxing and my father would teach me how to box even at a, as a very young age, right? Like the skill. So, you know, you combine the two and you get more of a kickboxer. And that's kind of the birth of kickboxing from that. No wonder you were so good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you went to Israel, mm -hmm. uh, you, you became one of the few female instructors in, for Krav Maga in, in the elite commando division. Can you explain a little bit about that? It must have been really difficult. Was this in the 80s? Yes. Well, I mean, see, the, the, the Israel Defense Force, they kind of scope you out before. Like they've done their research before I went even, it was even in there. So I was put in a selection base, right? So what they do is they take individuals where they see something unique. And for me, because I was not from Israel, you know, that it could be a good for working on, you know, maybe on an international, you know, um, intelligence department, right? And plus my skill as an athlete. So they wanted to see, you know, how I was mentally because their, their concern was, I didn't grow up in a harsh country like Israel, where it's a little bit more, you know, there's more stress and more, a little bit, you know, exposed to more violence. I was born in Canada, very, you know, nice country and everyone's so polite, nice. So, you know, can I meet that expectation? Except for those eight boys. They were right, Except for those boys. eight boys. Exactly. You know what I mean? But so that was the, the you know, if I could handle, but I, I was prepared. I mean, I did my research and, you know, members of my family were involved in that type of, of work, you know, and I always, um, you know, I studied it and I knew what I was, was what I was going to get into was going to be very difficult. So I was prepared for it. I think more than they thought I was. This interests me so much because my sister was a firefighter in the San Francisco Fire Department when there were only 15 women and 1,500 men. And oh, wow. it was yeah. um, the uh, sexism was terrible, not so much from the, the people who had been in for a really long time. It was the other new recruits that I guess felt like they had to sort of protect something that they'd never you know, that had come before them or something. And I wondered how, as a woman, even if the powers that be asked you to be a Krav Maga instructor, how it was dealing with uh, the men in an especially macho arena. Right. A good question. Um, th the sexism and all that stuff didn't happen in the military because the military was a very elite unit. Right. And we were doing things equivalent to the men because with 350 women that were selected, only five of us made it to a base called base eight for specific training. Right. You know, so we were kind of separated from the men. And then we were we were brought in as instructors. Right. You know, um, and even when I was faced, you know, what being because I was able to do the training that most even the men couldn't even do, which was unique. I even surprised myself with some of the things. And I think too, it was more of the mental stuff because I'll give you an example of a training like day, like we would go out on a trek. And don't forget where we have our M16s and our, you know, our magazines full and we're carrying water and we're carrying an extra 50, 60 pounds on us. We'd go for like, let's say 40 kilometers through the desert with our boots and it's hot. You know, we'd come back to the barracks. They'd say, okay, you guys get three hours rest, right? One commander would leave. Another one would walk in five minutes later, get your stuff back on. We're going back out. So it was that kind of stuff, right? Or going to bed and waking you up 30 minutes later for a drill exercise. So it was, you know what I'm saying? So you don't have time to worry about the girl or boy or whatever. You have to worry about yourself, right? So in that department, you know, I didn't face anything. Like seriously, I never heard one comment about me not being able to do my job because I was a woman. That happened when I transitioned into the police force. Then it was a whole new world for me. It was, yeah, it was, that's a whole new podcast. <laughs> it was insane, incredible. And I had no support. Not like now where women have more support. It just wasn't talked about because I was placed in a, in a division, in a unit where there was no women. There wasn't even barracks for me because it was never open to women. But I kind of break, broke those barriers because of a, the, the Brigadier General, Yaakov Turner, who's later the police commissioner. He gave me special permission. And all he did was open the doors for me. And that's it. He goes, whatever happens behind those doors, it's on you. So and that's he, when, you know, at 19, I had to, yeah, I completely, ch completely changed from the person I was. I had you think to. that you just didn't have that chance in the police force because you, you didn't have the um, opportunity to show your physical and mental capabilities as, you know, immediately and as intensely as you did in the in military, because it was like all you guys were, were doing was pre practicing and preparing, practicing and preparing. I mean, why, why? 
why wouldn't they see you as equal like the military did? It wasn't that. It was because I was trying to get into a division where, you know, women didn't, it, it wasn't even thought of a woman going into it, right? You know, it was one of the courses. And I think to when I, when I finally got in, it was, okay, let's try and crack her, right? And remember, you know, like mentally, crack me mentally, right, you know? Um, and, and for me, I always had to be one above everybody because if I had a bad day, it was because I was a woman. It wasn't just, oh, I just had a bad day. You know, with my partner. So I always had to be better than everyone else, right? But it was more people in power abusing authority, you know, and I, my hands were tied. So, you know, I had to suck it up and really, you know, kind of defend myself. And I did things of pulling out my guns on my partners for inappropriate behavior because there was no way I was going to take it. I was adamant, I mean, about that. You want to work with me, then you, you treat me the same way you treat anybody else, right? And they kind of tested the grounds with me. And eventually I just got a reputation of being a psychopath, which was fine because that, that behavior was what I needed to in order to survive that type of environment, which, which sucks, right? I mean, now it's completely different. But remember back then, I had no one but me and my Beretta. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that was it. <laughs> and this was the special forces. Tell us this what was, that This was going into the special forces, right? You know what I mean? Like the, the leeway. Because remember, when I when I, I worked for a branch of, because like, the military and the police, they work together, but they're completely different departments, right? So I did work on special assignments in the military, right? Um, intelligence assignments, you know, where they would put me on a bus, they'd send me to a location, I didn't know where I was going, and I would be given my assignment, you know, two minutes before it was to be done, right? And then not to mm. talk to anyone, I didn't know anybody, you just do what you're supposed to do, you don't know where you are, and you're coming back to your location, nobody asks you anything. So I did that type of work. But I wanted to do more of like intelligence civilian work, right? Not so much part of the military. I just ended up because of my skills in Krav Maga and the unit that I was in, they saw me as a, a good as asset to do certain operations, right? You know, but when I went into the police force, um, they right Im immediately put me into a uniform, which is kind of, you know, it's like going category pro racing into category four, right? you know, yeah. and I had a tough time. Wait, is there. that for those of us who aren't cyclo, is that a- Yeah, like it's like, you know, down? like- yeah, it's like a really low division, like a, a uniform caught back then. It's kind of, it's not really looked great upon, right? And that's, I mean, they put me in a, in a, in a police department in the middle of nowhere, in, in uniform, in a, in a police station where they rehabilitated criminals to become police officers. And that's where I was mm. located, right? You know, and I go, what the hell? I just came from intelligence doing the most secure work into like, you know, you know, scrubbing floors, right? But there was a purpose for what they were doing. They wanted to see how I interacted with that kind of crowd, like putting me kind of like, you know, throwing me in with the lions, right? You know, and it, it's fine. I, I get it, you know, but I, I really had to, you know, I don't know. It was it was mentally tough because I got it from all angles. Like people wanted to, to get rid of me so bad and the treatment was so bad and I had to act even crazier in order to survive this, right? But they basically pulled me out of there within three months. I got picked up by a spying agency called the Belouche. And the Belouche is an agency where you need three to four years of police experience, even to be considered. And they never, ever recruited a woman. I was three months in uniform and that's when I was recruited. So I was moved from that pretty darn fast. Oh, and what was wow. your experience in, in the Belouche? It was insane <laughs> because I did not have, okay, again, it would be going like category four to pro racing, right? You know what I, mean? <laughs> I didn't have that experience of working the streets, knowing criminals, knowing terrorists, knowing different operations, right? You know, I mean, they would take me out, for example, my part of my training was they take me through a street, let's say in Haifa, which is like New York, okay? Then they would point to different people and I'd have, by their face and by their accents, I'd have to know if they were Muslim, if they were Israeli, if they were, you know, from Iran or from Morocco or from whatever I'd have to listen to accents replicate accents I'd be sitting talking with you but I'd have to know what this person over here on my right is talking about and the person on my left I'd have to get information you know they'd say table number 40 over there get his phone number 
or you know what I mean? or things like that or you know you know or get someone's attention so it was that kind of stuff which was very difficult for me because I didn't have that kind of training right you know or they would purposely you know when I had to listen to communications they would purposely put the radio on really loud to distract me so you know I just felt like my brain was going to explode because I wasn't trained for that right you know um and also you see things that most normal people don't see like the violence that's involved and what you have to do and what you're required to do and then also your life is at stake most of the times what you're doing is extremely dangerous right so it's a it's a whole process that you know it's it, mentally it's very hard and no communications no friends no communication with your family you're isolated you're also transferred through different places in the country you know so it was basically me I mean my my therapist wasn't the debriefing that I was supposed to go to I had a bike and I'd go ride my bike and pedal really hard. And that was kind of my therapy in order to survive, you know, some of the things that I had to go through because it wasn't easy, again, coming from this country into, you know, into Israel and really seeing the reality of what I was getting myself into. So they recruited you after only three months, which usually it takes three to five years. Three weeks. So three, yes. Oh, three weeks. I thought you said three months. Holy no, smokes. Three, yeah, three okay. weeks in uniform. So you think about that, Dotsie, right? It's right, so why? Four. Why did they do, I mean, did they do, I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining they did mental toughness tests on you and were like, we want her. <laughs> she's, well, well huh, they, they had, they, she's insane. Well, yeah, I was going to say, well, don't forget, I mean, like the military and police work together. So they knew what I did, you know, in the, in, in base eight, in Krav Maga, uh, with the commando, yeah. you know, my, my um, my sergeants, my generals, I worked I worked under, right? You know, they all gave me great credentials, right? You know, because it's it's they know like yeah. the intelligence yeah. in Israel, they know everything about you. When I was interviewed, they would ask me specific questions, and I didn't give them really the full answers, but they would finish the answer for me. So mm -hmm. I knew they knew more about me probably uh, than I knew more about myself. Even mm -hmm. they asked me about you know where I lived in Vancouver, for example. You know, like you know, tell me about your house. And so I'd say, well, we had, I don't know, two bedrooms upstairs, one bedroom downstairs. I go, no, you didn't. You had three bedrooms upstairs and you had a basement and they would, you know what I'm saying? So it mm. was, it was that intense, right? And go, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, yeah. so that kind of world and reality of, of things that we're just not used to, right? You know, so I knew when they asked me something, I had to be deadly honest with them. And I wasn't always right, because I didn't want them to see a flaw or anything bad. I wanted to make it seem like I was completely perfect. And as we all know, no one is perfect, right? So right. did you like it? So you, you go into the Belush, I mean, were you happy? Did you enjoy it? Did you want to be there? Did you feel like it was almost like you were you know, hand selected. So it was an honor, but then as right. you got in and yeah, well, how, how was it for you and, and for your emotion and for your desire and, and what you were doing in, in your life? That well, time? that's a good, that's a really good question because I mean, remember I wanted to do this since I was seven years old, right? But you don't know the intensity of what you're getting no. into till you actually get into what you're doing, right? You know, right. and you're cut off um, from your whole family. Completely like, no, like, you know, even like I had uh, friends in, in Canada and I said, don't write me any letters. And they would, and it would be, because they open, they read everything. And also just for the safety of what I possibly had to do, I rather not have communication with anyone else, right? You know what I mean? Because even in the military, I mean, I was put on a, on a like I was almost kidnapped twice, right? You know, because it's hard to hide me, a woman, you know, in, in a very tiny country. So to keep everyone safe, I just decided that I didn't want any communications and I cut all ties with Canada, um, just for my sanity too, because it's almost worse when, you know, when something happens to somebody that you love than yourself, right? I don't care, you know what I mean? Like if you insult my mom, I take it more harder than you can insult me, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. in that respect, I just wanted to be like a robot, like robotic. And you had to become robotic. Like you couldn't have these feelings or feel sympathy for anybody because you wouldn't survive that, right? You know, because you see things very difficult things and and assassinations and death and and like I said things that most normal people don't experience you know you don't even see that on television mm -hmm. and we have to see it in real life and this is the reality you know and I started to become this um very isolated par paranoid person um and when I say that one of my biggest pet peeves is people po in power abusing authority I started you know I was actually really good at that you know and I almost felt like I had to in order to work um, properly in, in the type of work that I was doing, if that makes any sense. You were Give good us an at, example. Yeah. You were good at what? Um, I mean, I thought that I was kind of untouchable, right? You know, like, for example, 
this is a really stupid, I went for a run one day, right, you know, and there was three boys kind of, you know, I, I knew they were going to ca cause trouble for me, right, you, you know, I was in a little, I was in a little village on a dirt road, I had my gun, and I basically, you know, I came up to them, they, they blocked me, they wouldn't let me go. So I pulled out, they didn't know I had my pulled out my bread, I pointed at one at them. I took, you know, I, I always had cuffs on me, I, I cuffed them to the tree, and scared the <laughs> crap out of them. And then I carried on. And then I did my run came back, they were still cuffed, and then I whatever and, you know, just kind of things like that for fear, because of fear, I wanted them to fear me, right, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. or, or things like, you know, if there was a traffic, I, I finished an assignment or something and I had to get home and there was a traffic jam, I drive on the shoulder or I put my whatever, because yeah. I could do it. I had that kind of, yeah. I go, why should I sit in here? You know, I'm risking my life, whatever for every, everyone in here. That's how you start thinking, which isn't good. Right. I, I, and I understand mm -hmm. that now, but at that point you just, you know, you, you're numb to everything. To, to what's right, what's wrong, whatever. You just do what you mm -hmm. think is right and what's easier for you. And because I had that kind of um, a power and authority, whatever, I started to abuse it in ways that right now I think, I go, how could you, you could ever do something like that? But until you're in that situation, you yeah. start to understand why you do that, you know? And especially being a woman, you know, when we would arrest people or whatever, they always gave me the hardest time. So I always put them in their place right from the beginning, like just because it really, this is what you do, or, you know, they say something not polite or whatever, then I, I kind of, you know, make them pay for it because I was getting so angry at everything. Right. And I think it was just, again, the intensity of what you're, you're gone through, going through on a daily basis. And I actually started not to really dislike people of, you know, how can we be so bad to each other? Like, why? And I, and I couldn't wrap my, my mind about certain situations and why we are the way we are. And, you know, so it was kind of a tough, confusing time for me. Yeah. How long were you in this? Um, this Till I was 30. <laughs> oh, 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 wait, that's 18 to 30. You were in 12 years? Yeah. Wow. And so you seem so far from that person. Are you? Or have, how have, how were you able to open your heart again? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, you, you start to grow out of it. I mean, it was a very hard transition because I basically got out because it was getting too dangerous for me to be there, right? You know, because of the certain assignments that I was on, they wanted me to work outside of the country, right? You know, to do work outside of Israel because it was getting too dangerous for me to stay there, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and and, and that's when I started to do duathlons and, and riding my bike was the only thing that really made me feel alive. And I thought, damn, you know what? Life is too short. I want, you know, you have to do the things that you love. And I mean, it was insane from what I had gone through for 10 years. And all of a sudden now I want to be this pro bike racer. And I was so, it was so conflicting and hard for me. And I was embarrassed to tell anybody, right. You know, but that was what I wanted to do. And I thought I was good enough. Right. Cause remember I was a big fish in a small pond, but when I came to North, North America, I mean, I got my ass kicked, right. It was a shrimp in an ocean. You know? <laughs> so the reality hit when I came back here, but mind you too, I was still working, you know, when I was back in, in North America, kind of going back and forth and making my transition before I could actually race full time. But because of my work, I could train full time. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, you, you were, you were like very, very, very fit on day one, like the first time you clipped in, you know, so you didn't, right. <laughs> so that's how you just, like, you just were delivered that way. How, how did, how long did it take and what was the journey to, I guess, almost redirect that the the emotional state that you were just speaking about that you were in when you were in the Belouche because I certainly uh and, and I think our listeners can tell from the story I told about you never met that Leia the old one <laughs> yeah like how <laughs> long did it was it a transition you know I mean yeah. you, knowing right from wrong and you know not using your authority you, you were the opposite of that Right. When I raced with you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was up to that even before I got into that. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and it was funny because in the transition was hard because when I did come back to North America, I, you know, it was my second day in Canada and I was driving my father's car and I was speeding and I got pulled over. And I remember going, what the hell? Why are you pulling me over for? Like, you know, because my mind wasn't trying. Well, you know what? You're you're like everybody else, girl. Right. <laughs> You're going to get a ticket, right? <laughs> but in Israel, whatever, I mean, you know, you, there's certain things that you have in your car. Like, you know, we had our, our SWAT uh, hats, so we put it on the dash. 
then it's kind of a, a known thing that when officers see that, they know don't pull this person over, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, I didn't have that in Canada. So then I, I go, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I can totally get a ticket now, <laughs> right? And it was hard because I felt like I was stripped. You know what I mean? I felt like I was mm -hmm. almost like nothing because you have this big head, you have so much authority and power. And then all of a sudden you're down to, down to earth and you're like everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. So that took, it took a while for sure, you know, and I actually had doubts of if I made the right decision to come back here, maybe I should go back to Israel, right? You know what I mean? But the more I, I realized, you know, what I had done was the best thing I could have done. Cause I don't know what would have happened. I think I would have gone insane if I did stay there. Yeah. I'm sure the power is intoxicating though. So it was a, it was, it was, a, it was, it took a bit to come down to planet earth. Oh yeah. Yeah. As you, <laughs> During that um, time when you were there in the Belouche, first you were the only woman. I imagine you had, that was it's very valuable to have somebody in there whom nobody expected would be part of this undercover uh, force. During that time, did they add more women? They, after actually the, the first course that I went into, um, it was a, uh, we have to back it up a little bit it was that was the the breakthrough that I made for women to enter um a certain uh division where it was never like I said that was the place where they didn't even have barracks for women right but when Yaakov Turner the general of the the IDF saw what I had done he actually opened the doors for all women to do the course right you know um so that was kind of the breakthrough and then the Belush yes after I did I mean now I'm sure there are it's the thing is though with Belush agents they don't say oh whew, I'm a Belush agent <laughs> whatever nobody knows what you are doing right but I'm sure there are and there's different branches of intelligence too that women, you know, um, are involved in, I'm sure. But again, it's such a, a closed and secretive, um, you know, world that we don't know. But I'm sure that there, there probably is after, you know, after me showing that women can do this type of work, I'm sure many doors have, have opened since. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you leave and you come back to North America and you'd been, you'd been riding your bike before uh, quite a lot. And was that just because it, it just felt like a good form of exercise or did they just, you know, that you had, there, there were, there were bikes there and you picked it up one day or what was that? What was the first, the very first No, title? actually um, uh, a Lieutenant from the commando um, was Israel's national champion in the sport of triathlon. And he saw me always training. This is when I was in base eight with the commando group and I was in, in very in good shape, right? You know, and he saw that I commuted with my bike right you know because mm -hmm. we couldn't afford cars you know our right. military wage was pee, pee you know and so he <laughs> just said he just says you know do you want to come for a ride with me and I didn't want to go but I didn't want to say no you know what I mean under pressure so then he that's kind of how the whole cycling thing started and there wasn't any women's racing in Israel there was only duathlons and triathlons and so um and because I don't like the water so I stuck to the duathlons and that's where I started winning races we both, you know, were national champions within a year after, you know, have him coaching me. And, and I was good at the duathlons, not because of the running, it was because of the riding, right? Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, it's nothing much to brag about. I didn't have much competition, right? You know, but it was the sport itself that I really loved and I really wanted to pursue it. So that's kind of, kind of the opening of this whole cycling business. Yeah. And so you took that, you took that first leap. I mean, you started out as a four, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah that's four, right. Yeah. And went and, and became a category one in a matter of 12 months. Well, actually, no. <laughs> I mean, I excelled fast from category four to category two, because, or three, sorry, because I could rely on my fitness. But as you know, Dotsie, cycling is very much, um, it's very strategic and it's like a chess game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you go out there and you burn your matches in the first half of the race, you're going to be a potato, right? You know? <laughs> and so I thought I could, re I could rely on just my fitness, right? But they would toy with me. I mean, in the first part of my cycling career, this is probably before you even came in, I would go into these races and I would come in so last, I wouldn't even know where the finish was. Everybody would leave. I'd see my car in an empty parking lot and I go, damn, this must be it. I've and had it was those moments. Once or <laughs> it was multiple times right and it was so embarrassing right and so and it was the first time 
writing really that I struggled with something, you know, because with a lot of things I did, mm. I excelled pretty fast and I got yeah. good pretty fast, but not with cycling. Like, you know, it took me like almost eight years before I could climb a hill properly. Right. You know, and I couldn't understand why I was struggling so much because with cycling, I mean, people don't realize how difficult it is. It's not just a matter of your fitness. There's so many other elements that's involved and I didn't have it. And being such an individual person, it was hard for me realizing mm. that that pro racing is very much a team sport mm -hmm. and you cannot mm -hmm. do it on your own when you're going into the big pro races, right? You know, you need your team and you all have to, you know, kind of mingle in the same way. The chemistry has to be right. And as, as you know, Dotsy, that's not always the case, right? You know, <laughs> and a lot of times when you're on a team and everybody wants to be a winner there, you know, you can't have too many chiefs on one team. Then there's friction because then there's conflict. Well, I don't want to work for you. Why should I work for you? You don't want to work for me, blah, blah, blah. Right. You know, mm -hmm. so that whole dynamic of cycling was difficult for for me right you know i mean i did eventually you know it's very rare that you yeah. find the right team where the chemistry is good and you're all on the same page right yeah but that, that was kind of a struggle for me that's why i knew my transition into ultra endurance racing was mm -hmm. going to be a lot easier for me and i knew too that i'd probably excel a little bit faster than eight years on <laughs> as a voting right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean the technical aspect is what was so hard for me right. i mean you know it's like you're i was strong but i i just i when i first started i had a soft ride which triathletes know what that is and it doesn't have a seat post and so and oh, i was yeah. doing i was doing crits and everyone was like oh my god because i'm like <laughs> boing, 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 you know around every corner it's just like so yeah. unsafe and it, i was just a train wreck uh, technically right. and that 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 takes quite a while to yeah. pick up those technical skills. I never, ever really actually felt right at them, even at the end of you know, right. my career. Right. Just never yeah. really. um, but I want to talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned the pressure um, of, uh, you know, Team Canada and, yeah. and, and, you know, you're too old, you're, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you, you don't fit into the right mold. There's no category uh, for me. There's no category. Yeah. You're just, yeah. I don't, we don't know what to do with you. And then you're really quite good. So they had to figure out what to do with you. Um, and we've talked a, a little bit about eating disorder on a email here or there. And I know that you have, have spoken about it, but I'd like to go uh, traverse that a bit in, in. So you're this, what seems like coming into cycling quite confident. Uh, mm -hmm. is it from the outset, you know, from the right. outside, that's what it's, that's what it looks like from the outside. Right. Uh, and then you have these powers at be, which I am, I'm going to assume, and you're probably going to shake your head. We're all men and mm -hmm. team Canada telling yeah. you what size you should be and, you know, yeah. how you should be and, and everything. And, um, so I, I remember in Altoona, you dieting during mm -hmm. the stage race. And I remember you were drinking a lot of crystal light. Yeah. <laughs> because I was like, because we, we, we had a bunk bed and I remember the crystal lights being opened like the, yeah. uh, uh, almost all hours of the day. And I was like, is this, should I be doing crystal light? Does this seem like, you know, because <laughs> you were so good. Um, so what, what the, the, the Leia, you're the same Leia still today after all, even yeah. more incredible, amazing uh, journeys and accolades, but the Leia that was in the military and then the Leia that was told, hmm, you're not the right size, shape, fit, that I'm assuming started to catapult the dieting. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that how it unfolded? And, oh, and what yeah, I that? mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the food issues wasn't so much, I mean, I was on the national development team, which they, they, they positioned a whole bunch of Canadian riders that saw potential in Europe. Right. And mm -hmm. so it says, you know, in Europe, they all have eating disorders, everybody like, you know, they're eating 500 calories or whatever or they're, you know, what do you call it? Bulimia, the you women? know. I think both. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. say both, right? Because they were like yeah. swizzle sticks, right? You know, and then off season, they, you know, they gain 50 pounds or whatever, right? You know, and you see the inconsistency Literally. too, right? You know, mm -hmm. same with performance and stuff, as you know, too, there's, it's more than just dieting issues in Europe, right? Which was a struggle yeah. as well. But I think too, I mean, as soon as we got off the plane and we landed in France, because I, I, I stayed in Europe for about two years with the, with the development team. Um, the first thing that the, the French director said is you guys are all fat, all of us, right? You know what I mean? And I mean, of course, some of the girls were crying and this and this, and I kind of thought it was funny because <laughs> that stuff doesn't bug me, right? You know, but, um, but yeah, and they restricted our, our food and our diet and whatnot, you know, and, um, 
And, and it did. I mean, look, look, if you can carry less weight up a hill, you go faster, right? You know, but you also have to think like, we don't think about, well, what's going to happen after we retire from cycling, right? You know what I mean? When you, when you play with your metabol metabolism that much, right? And your health and, 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 you know, but they don't care. All they care about in, in professional cycling, I'm going to say it's almost any sport is your performance that day, that year, whatever. It doesn't matter what happens to you in five years or four years or next year. It's what happens in this next race, right? Because you want to, you want to keep your sponsors happy as well right you know so I think that's when again I went into that kind of that rabbit hole as well okay I got to be as thin as possible because I was riding better as a thinner you know as a thinner rider mind you I feel like crap for the rest of the day but I could pull it off for two three hours right because women's races are not seven hours normally right you know as you know Dotsie right so you know being 110 pounds whatever I could fly up those hills and, and compete with the Europeans right you know um, otherwise your, your pack fill. So yeah, you get into, you know, your brain starts to go funky and you're losing all this weight. I mean, even in Hewlett Packard, I don't know if you can remember it one year, I mean, I was so thin that my, my shorts were like baggy. Right. You know, and my director said, if you don't put on weight, we're, we're ditching you from the team. Right. You know, but for me, because of that extreme personality, okay, I can lose another 10 pounds and another 10 pounds and another 10 pounds. Right. You know? Um, so yeah, I mean, you learn from that. I absolutely went through that eating disorder thing, whatever. And I think most racers did, you know, that I've raced with more, primarily in Europe and many also in, in North America. Yeah. When did the um, vegetarianism and veganism come in to your diet? When I was young, <laughs> when I was like a little kid, you know, um, that happened, my goodness. I mean, I was so attached to animals and I don't know why. Like I could never watch Bambi or any last year or, or whatever, you know, any any show where an animal would die, right? I mean, I'd rather watch Friday the 13th at, at seven years old than watch an animal die. And so I decided I'm not eating meat. And I told my mom, right? You go, I don't want, I'm not eating meat, you know, at that. And I did, and I stayed, you know, um, I, mostly I'm going to say I mostly ate fruit, right? Even in the military, right? I mean, I called myself a fruitarian, you know, and I remember them telling me too, like, oh, when you're 40, you're going to get osteoporosis and whatnot, you know, and I ended up getting a test when I was 45. And I was all in the green, except for one little spot in my back because of uh, some accidents and kickboxing, right? However, when I came back from the Middle East, primarily on a plant based fruit diet, you know, and I came back to North America, like to, to Canada, and they sent us to Europe. I mean, there was nothing to eat there. They would serve like, you know, in, in Europe, the organizers serve you food. So it's always white rice, white bread, white pork, you know, white, white food, cheese, we call white, it's we... white, everything is white, you know what I mean? No and nutrients. So, and yeah, and so the dietitian basically, and so my, of course, my performance you know, it, it went down mm -hmm. the toilet because I didn't eat any of the meat stuff and whatnot. So then when we came back to North America, she basically said, well, you know, you're, you'll, you'll never excel if you don't start eating real protein. Right. You know, and of course, you know, that's what I, I was told. And I don't know any better. And I so badly wanted to do this sport and I so badly did not want to, but I did, I did cave in and I started to incorporate more like fish and meat and whatnot. And I did drop the weight, but I felt like crap. Right. You know what I mean? I absolutely did. It didn't matter, but I still perform better because listen, you can still be a vegetarian and be unhealthy. If you're, all you're eating is cake and pasta and bread and you know what I mean? Yeah. And not any meat, you can still not be healthy. And I think that was more my diet because that's all I had access to there. Right. You know, so I did transition, um, but I ate very little meat and, and uh, no beef, just a little bit of chicken and a little bit of fish, you know, but for me, and even to this day, more than than health reasons, more humanitarian reasons. It's because I just love animals too much and I felt like a hypocrite, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then I said, no, this is, this is not right. And I think, and remember my father's, you know, he mentioned the game changer that the documentary, Dotsie, that you were in, right, you know? And it was like, you slapped me across the face. You know, what the hell are you doing, girl? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> when I watched that and I went back to how I ate in the Middle East and I'm not kidding instantly. I felt better. I rode better. I slept better. My recovery was better. My mind was clear. And what the hell, you know, were you doing all these years? But mind you again, too, it's not like I was a big meat eater and I don't do any dairy because I'm lactose. So that was already out of the question. Right. You know, um, but for me, it's just it's just the right thing to do. And it makes you feel better. You feel better about the environment, better about yourself. Yeah. And, you know, I just think that was the best thing that I could have done is going back to the way I was you know, in the Middle East in my early, in my early twenties. 
Yeah. The psychology of it is, yeah. you know, really enhances the, yeah. the physical experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the worst mm -hmm. years I, I had as an athlete and my performance is when I was eating meat. <laughs> I mean, and I was, yeah. I, I didn't feel good. That's the thing though, right? Is being kind of lethargic and tired and, and kind of short with people. And I don't know if that has exactly to do with the meat eating, but I know for me personally, when I made that transition, everything did change for me in the most positive way. Mm. <laughs> and you won the race across America, which Dotsie talked about in the introduction, she called it RAM, it's race across America. And you did that as a vegan. Absolutely, yes. Mm. Yeah. That, that is, it is uh, definitely worth diving into. I you yeah. were going to do RAM in 2020. Yeah. And then it did, because I I, th I think that the when we reconnected was right prior to that, and it was just yeah. about nutrition and diet. And, yeah, you know, you're like, right. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm, get, I'm putting the wheels back on. Like, I got to do, yeah. I got to yeah. do this. And you knew that that was going to be the absolute best t way of eating for your digestive system for RAM. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think when people think of RAM and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from experience is this really extraordinary endurance event, which it is. Yep. And that you just, you know, you have to have, you know, tough m m mind for sure, but you just have to have this extraordinary ability to go really long distance and, and definitely uh, there's suffering involved in that. Um, but what I don't think people mm -hmm ever think of is the gut issues that unfold when you are doing anything all yeah. day and all night and not oh, stopping. Yeah. So in right after uh, uh, Olympics for me, so maybe like 2014, uh, th three uh, wonderful, strong female cyclist asked me to do the four person female Ram um, to try to break the four person female record. So right. just everyone that's four whole people yep. did it all by herself. So we, we, we were going to get to rest a lot as we went right, along right. across the country. And so I said, I don't know, maybe I'll think, maybe, you know, I'll think about it. And they said, okay, let's do just race across the West. So you can feel what it's like, which right. was 500 miles. It was like a day. It was, you know, literally nothing compared to, to full ramp. So we do it. And it was the most horrible experience almost of my life because I didn't know what to do about my, my gut. And I, I was, yeah, plant-based by that point. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't, I didn't know, I, I didn't know anything. When and you say we, gut, Dotsie, what does that mean? It's so, yeah, we have, a, we've had a lot of gut doctors on this show. And I think, okay. you know, people have gut distress from all sorts of different right, reasons. Right. I think a lot of it is the effort, but I think a lot of it is that your, 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 you know, your body is, your, your body clock is yeah. in tuned with what your regular schedule is. So when right. you are hammering on the 10 freeway at two o'clock in the morning, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't know what's going on. And it right. was explosive diarrhea in the middle of the desert. Yeah. Ex like beyond anything that I ever, I was like, I did not sign up for this. And I it did, so, told them no on Ram because I couldn't even do 24 hours. So <laughs> To, that Sorry. is a fascinating yeah. aspect. And right. because we talk about plants and, and plant-based right. eating and the power of it right. on the show, I would love to know what you were eating, how you kept your gut in check and in your gut calm enough to be able to, yeah. to do uh Ram and, and win and totally kick ass. Well, let me just tell you something. Almost a hundred percent of Ram riders will tell you that they have distress, that distress, you know what I mean? constipation, diarrhea, you know, um, not being not nausea, whatever. Yeah. I didn't experience one gut issue in this Ram. And mind you, we were in 50 degrees Celsius, which is what in Fahrenheit, 120. It's 123. Yeah, 120 like, yeah. So yeah. as you know, the conditions in Ram, whatever, but not only from Ram, but even prior, like when I made the transition into a plant-based diet, and I would train very difficult, like, you know, 24 hours, 36 hours, we did practice races and I, you know, and never ever stomach cramps or pain. I'm, I'm regular, right? You know what I mean? Just sticking to a clean diet. And, you know, I'm thinking to 
um, knowing myself too and, 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 and scheduling things properly, right? But it was unbelievable. The only thing that we suffered through in this RAM was the damn temperatures. That was it. Everything else was great. It was, like I said, it was just the heat, you know, um, getting enough fluid in, right, you know, uh, and just trying to keep th staying, riding through those kind of temperatures. Because even at nighttime, it barely cooled down, right? You know, the, the nice thing yeah. at nighttime, you didn't have that blaring sun on you, right? But going back to the food thing, I mean, it was like clockwork. I, it was the most easiest part for me, which is unheard of in RAM. I mean, I don't think unheard you talk to any RAM rider who won't tell you that, they didn't feel like eating or whatnot. I just knew that going through the desert, I'm sticking to liquids. I cannot eat solids, right? And then it transitioned as soon as you get out of kind of that kind of heat, which never happened, of course. But I mean, I basically stuck to smoothies, you know. Um, heat is my sponsor. They have a lot of plant-based, um, you know, vegan um, uh, products. Yeah, that I heat, eat, like right? H-E-E-D. Exactly. So people heat, can okay. The Perpetuum is also plant-based, mm -hmm. right? They have plant-based mm -hmm. bars, you know. So it's a, it's a, it, it was awesome. It was excellent right you know and I just knew what worked for me I kept it simple fruit watermelon bananas apples grapes you know okay. my wraps were just like um like a tofu scramble that's you gave me some recipes too, your granola bars or whatever yeah. just kept it super simple yeah. you know what I mean and then how about potatoes much. did you do sweet potatoes Idaho potatoes regular I did not not the I did some sweet potatoes it was just because it's you know when you're on the movie that sometimes it's hard for the crew to cook and you know what I mean so I just stuck to what worked, you know, very simple, very boring, but enough to get me, keep me um, not feeling kind of heavy or blocked down, you know what I mean? And, and not an issue whatsoever, not at all. How many calories a day were you, or I should, yeah, and when I say a day, I mean 23 hours, I think. I, yeah, mean, I mean, very, very little in that 11 days. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say really, because it kind of fluctuates, like in the beginning, you know, maybe close to 10,000, maybe less. I mean, I ended up dropping 15 pounds when I, when I made it to the other side, right? Because you really can't replace that much, right? You know what I mean? You can, you know, you're, you're kind of going on fumes at the end, because again, the heat just made it just impossible, right? To really eat anything. So when you're sticking to a liquid diet, you almost feel more full, you know, like liquids in your belly makes you feel that false feeling of full, you know? So I think that's, that was the challenge. But again, I had no issues, which was crazy, right? You know, because everyone else did. But yeah. in regards to the diet, zero, 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 zero. That is, I, I don't think anyone's ever said that. <laughs> it's just a, so did you have uh, competitors ask you about your diet? As, well, especially after you won, because that's just interesting in, in, in general, right. like what you were fueling yourself with. But to not have any gut issues, I'm sure that that, you know, made it around that you were, you weren't right. experiencing. I mean, I th I don't think most people, I, you know, I mean, I think there's three things that's hard to talk about with people. It's religion, politics, and food. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're going to have conflicting, you know, I think meat eaters are pretty adamant about, no, you need your right protein and you can't get enough protein and blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. And so I don't fight with that to, to each their own. Right. You know, I basically know what works for me. And it always has, even when I was a little seven-year-old kid, whatever, right? All my issues started once I put, started putting in, in, you know, heavier, feet, you know, meat products mm -hmm. into my diet when I started feeling as, as, again, it was the feeling of feeling terrible, right? But I mean, I can say it, but, uh, but I know people are kind of, they're kind of rolling their eyes. So I didn't, I don't advertise it too much, but you'd be surprised though, how many great athletes are, are plant-based. Yeah. We just don't, they don't talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. They just don't like a secret weapon <laughs> a little performance enhancement we're not going to get right exactly <laughs> we don't need the competitors jumping on yeah I keep uh, your meat keep eating your whatever your beef <laughs> pork or whatnot <laughs> you're an expert in suffering and it's so it doesn't surprise me that you would choose to do ram this was your third attempt at, right well attempt you 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 finished the others too didn't you also? yeah I, I won yes. the first one second on the second one and then I won this one yeah. so uh you have yeah excelled at three rams um when you won the women's category yeah First the first one. one you won the women's category, not the yes. overall. Like, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. no. This I is mean, the first. Yeah, this yeah. What happened this, this year is, is the first time in in the history of the sport. Thirty nine years. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and to and to to beat your uh, the next the next person who was a man by um, you know so much time sixteen almost hours. a day. So yeah, <laughs> I'd like you to talk about the challenges that this 
uh, Dotsie talked about the gut distress, but sleep and things like Shermer's neck and saddle sores. I don't think people understand how challenging this race is. I mean, it's considered by some as the hardest uh, athletic challenge that you can do. Yeah, I mean, with saddle sores, it's not a matter of if, but when you're going to get them. And it's a matter of controlling them. Like, I mean, some of the things you can do is changing your shorts quite often, keeping it clean. And then, I mean, I had like Are they blisters the for people who aren't riders? They're blisters. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're blisters and it's excruciating. Like, you know, you know, Dotsy Dotsy. Yeah, sores, well, right? and some so, of them are like, they're like sores. They're like a, they're the worst open, pimple you've ever had. But yeah, yeah. And, and they're open sores too, because you're constantly sitting on it, right? You know, so- I mean, it's a matter of using the right saddle, right position and getting a proper bike position, you know, again, changing your shorts as much as you can. I mean, it's hard when you're doing ultra endurance racing because that's time, right? The clock doesn't stop ticking. So, but I mean, it's a matter of, of just managing it because you're going to get it. I don't care who you are. I mean, I don't think there's any racer or whatever. That's one thing that you can't, you know, it's unavoidable because of that pressure on that one point, it's going to bruise and eventually it's going to open. What about sleep? And you also had Shermer's neck in one of your um, one of your, yes. your first race, I think maybe is that right? And, yes, uh, yes. Uh, I, I, it was, it's fascinating how you dealt with that. Well, on my first ram, of course, we didn't know what we were doing, right? And um, and I went in there thinking, oh yeah, I got this. I'm going to break a record and whatnot, you know. And so actually, the first three days, I was on record breaking pace. But, you know, I came from a pro racing background where everything is very aero and fast and speed and whatnot. That's not ultra endurance racing is a matter of comfort, right? On day three, I kind of felt this sharp pain shoot from my head down to my buttocks and all the muscles kind of that support. Shermer's like basically is it's all the muscles that support your head, they collapse. So my head fell and my chin was resting on my, you know, on my chest and I couldn't move it. I could not move my head. So in order to ride my bike, I had to support my head with one hand and control that, you know, the handlebar brakes shifting, whatever with the other, this is day three. So my crew says, you know what, there is no way we're going to finish this. You know, it's because of course my speed starts, you know, it starts this, you know, slowing down and we're, the record is out the, out the door and other riders are starting to catch up with me. And I said to my crew, I go, you got to come up with an apparatus. I don't care what it is, but we're getting across the country. I don't care if it's going to take me a year. So what they did, you know, we tried many different things. They basically shaved me from year to year. So I had hair on top of my head. They took tensor bandage. They French braided it into my head, top of my hair here. They pulled my head back and they tied it to the back of my heart rate monitor. So it's kind of like a bobble head. Um, and then that's how I finished the first race across America. And I actually was still managed to win it. Right. But I mean, that was excruciatingly painful for seven days. Right. I mean, it was so painful that I'd be barfing off the side of the bike, rotating Advil, Aleve and aspirin just to kind of manage that kind of pain. Right. It was insane. So what we do now, you guys, when I do any ultra race, if you look closely, mm -hmm. I'm shaved from year to year. The, the bandages are in my hair and I'm already tied at every start line before every race because Shermer's neck is kind of a nerve damage condition. It happens oh. to people that have gone through like whiplash, you know, it, that's, as you know, in cycling, how many times we've crashed, right? So you can't really train it. I mean, I do do st strength training for the neck, but it's most mm -hmm. likely that it will happen to me almost hundred percent if I don't have an apparatus to support my head before I even get into any ultra race. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And what about sleep and hallucinations? I think it's fascinating how you get through those, how you deal with the sleep issue. Dotsie and I wouldn't be able to do it, right? Dotsie, well, yeah. you know, <laughs> well, Dotsie's think, missed nine yeah. hours a night on a good day. So wow, on a bad a, day, that's a week for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think sleep, you can't really train. I think you have it or you don't, right? But here's the interesting thing. I mean, I don't know if it has to do with diet, right? So when I do RAM, we always go through the first night into the second night. So I'm writing about from 43 to 46 hours nonstop. Then I'll go down for three hours and then I'll rest every 24 hours after that. Now, you know that after about 15 hours, you do start to hallucinate because your brain just goes funky on you, right? And everything starts to whatever. And this year is the first year that I did have some hallucinations, but nothing that affected my riding. And I don't know if it was because of my diet or, you know, being experienced or whatnot, knowing how to manage it because the other two rounds, like for example, in 2019, 
my hallucinations were so violent. Like at some point I would see panthers leaping at me that I'd veer over to the other side of the road. You know what I mean? Oof. That it affects you, your safety on the bike, right? Yes. You know? So, so this year, I mean, I knew kind of, you know, you're hallucinating. You, sometimes you do. I mean, a lot of times my crew would say, no, that, you know, that man with the dog in the middle of the night standing on the side of the road, that's real, right? <laughs> I mean, so they'd give me indications, right? But this year it was the most calm and just, you know, it wasn't so violent. Nothing leaped out at me, you know, and it was more relaxed if, I, if that makes any sense, right? Because usually you're like, you're, you're, things are in front of you and, and things you see crossing the roads, you start breaking. It's insane how, you know, your, your brain just goes crazy. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, right? I'm, I'm a, maybe something like being on, you know, mushrooms, or I don't know, right? But it's kind of that, you know, where, where things just, you know, they just come out of nowhere and and it can be dangerous too where at, at points too where your crew actually has to stop you and force you to sleep just to you know give your brain a little bit of relax time you you keep saying we because it's your crew and I, I, uh, people that are not um you know adept at at ram talk they're just the most critical component oh and, they're and, and they're your winner no, lose yes they are and did you so yeah. your crew did you have them for all three Rams? And what is what is their secret to getting yeah. you across the country? You know, exactly. and I think you would I even mean, say that's a fair statement. Getting you oh, across absolutely. the country. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. I mean, without a, a a good proper crew, you're you're gonna suffer for sure. You know what I mean? They are responsible. When I I didn't win the race. We won the race. You know, they're my navigators. They're my dietitians. They're my nurses. They're my massage therapists. They're, they're my, my psychiatrists. You know, they have to know everything about me during the different stages. They have to know the terrain that, you know, they have to navigate everything. You know, they are so, it's so crucial. I can't even emphasize how important it is to have a crew. And don't forget, you're taking nine people that are also going to be sleep deprived. They're going to be hungry. They're going to be cranky. And the chemistry between them also starts to conflict sometimes right yeah, yeah. so it's a real huge challenge to get you know a proper crew that you know can actually get across the country without something happening right you know um so i'm super fortunate to have the same crew with me that they've done it before they know me they know each other and so in that regards i'm i'm very fortunate and i love them all for for everything they've done for me yeah, they almost have to have the same mental fortitude and toughness that you do. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I they mean, yell at me because even when I slow down or I want to stop or whatever, you know, they're no, no. <laughs> and they know that, right, you know, for the most part. And they and they have to be tough with you. And it's hard when you see somebody, you know, that you care about and they're suffering and you got to push yeah. them and kind of be mean to them. It's not easy to do that, right? And they say that's the hardest part for them, right, mm -hmm. is when they're saying, you know, you're going to go another 50K or another 50 miles or whatnot before you're allowed to get off the bike yeah so in the first in the first ram you had the, the 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 next scenario i'll call it and you were you so you saw a bunch of people passing you and then you you know got your neck your head strapped back and yep, then you yep. started passing people what, what was the moment in in this year's ram in july where you um really sort of stepped beyond yourself that you and and you 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 knew that this was the, the the moment that you were pressing forward enough that you had a chance to win and break the record and 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 beat all the men because in almost every race we've ever done together you know there's there's those there's those moments sometimes there's a few but sometimes there's one right yeah um well I mean. There was some good, like Mark, the guy from the United Kingdom, he was the favorite to win. And then there was the other Dutchman. He was that big seven, seven foot, whatever guy. Because, as you know, I wasn't in the lead in the first part of the race. Right. I was fifth, but, you know, and then I started to... Right. To right. drop, you know, catch people because with Ram, that's the mistake is the race doesn't start till you hit Kansas, right? And then the hardest part is when you hit the Appalachians. It's a crazy hilly, right? Right from, from West Virginia all the way into Maryland, right? To Annapolis. So that's where you really have to ride within yourself. I'm um, still go fast, of course, but stick to your plan, right? You know, because even when Mark passed me in Kansas, I think it was, he flew by me like I was standing still. Mm -hmm. And so my crew are kind of in a panic, whatever. Oh, you know, because we were in the lead up into that point. And I go, just wait, you know, the Appalachians are coming in. He knows it too. He's done it nine times, right? So it was a long shot. But I knew at that point when he did pass me that his gaps 
we're within, you know, 20, what's that, 10 miles, we're always within 10 miles, 15 miles, whatever. And so I knew I go, you know what, he's struggling, because if he was going to pass me that fast away, he yeah. did, it was like a mind yeah. game, right, you know, yeah. and I said, no, I'm going to make my moves in the Appalachians. And that's exactly what we did. Wow. Yeah. That's so what to, I want to know what that 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 felt like, because I know when I've had moments in much, much, much shorter races, it's almost like the pain starts to dissipate. And it's almost like that your mind goes to a place that is very difficult to ever go to in any other period and point in, in life. It's almost like there's like this clearing and there's like this this tiger kind of comes out and it's like this confidence. It did, did that, did you have that? You know what I did when he took his sleep break in, um, in the app coming into the Appalachians, kind of the start of the mountain passes, you know, um, right. the mountain range, I saw his car and whatever, and he was taking a break and I had passed him. And then I, then I knew I had about three more hours left before I would take my, cause you know, we follow each other's sleep patterns, right? You know, I had about three more hours left in me. They tried to push me a little bit more. So I got off the bike and I figured, okay, when I'm sleeping now, he's going to pass me. Right. Cause it's kind of like cat and mouse. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I got back on the bike, you know, after they gave me 90 minutes because at this point it was between him and I, and it was a good possibility that I could win. So they had, something had to be cut. That was my sleep. So 90 minutes later, oh, I'm back on the bike. Right. You know, so we had, we started cutting my sleep now for, to 90 minutes to nothing, like to try and push me right to the end. Right. You know? And so then when I radioed in, I said, how far is Mark in front of me? Right. And then headquarters said, he's not in front of you. He's still behind you, which confused me. Right. You know, so then another three hours passed and I'm expecting to maybe see him pull up or whatever, you know, and then I think maybe 10 hours later, they said that he had pulled, he had pulled out of the race. Oh. And that's when, however, there's no victory, whatever, you know, speech I was preparing or anything like that with race across America, anything can happen. I still had a boatload of miles to go. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and like, look what happened to me a mile from the finish. You know what I'm saying? Like it took me an hour to crawl across and I almost ended up in the hospital. Right. So I knew not to get too excited. And I knew not to push too hard just to ride my ride. Right. And again, the temperatures are what really, I mean, I think at that point it was like day nine and a half of riding in over a hundred Fahrenheit that I now it's body, super humid. Yeah. My body just country. said, basically you screw you. <laughs> I mean, it had enough. Right. You know, and at that point, I wasn't eating well. I wasn't drinking properly. You know, I just kind of want super sleep deprived and tired and just, you know, riding on fumes. And I think like a, about a mile, maybe a little bit more before the finish heart rate shot up and I collapsed off the bike. I, somebody, somebody's lawn, whatever. And I fell off the bike and I started to shake and I've never experienced that before. I go, what the heck is happening? And we had, a, I had a paramedic on board, right? You know, he came out and you know, lied me down, put legs up or whatever, trying to get my heart rate down. And it wouldn't go down. It was like 170, 200, whatever. And my heart rate is normally very low. And so I'm allowed, you know, you're allowed to walk with your bike just no one can touch me. So one of my crew members gave me her pink oversized running shoes. I took my, and I started to walk my bike, right? And that's what took me, it took me over an hour for that last mile. And if you look at the real finish, I'm actually rolling into the finish with pink running shoes and two crew members are running beside me just in case I tip over. Right. And as soon as I cross, you see the ambulance, the fire department coming after yeah. me, whatever. And that was it was a really scary moment because they didn't they wanted me to basically take me from that mile finish to the hospital. I knew I had I mean, the guy behind me was 17 hours back. Right. You know, yeah. so I said, right. even if I did ended up going, but I said, no, no, no. I mean, I could taste it. It's right there. Right. And then as soon as I crossed the line, everything went back to normal. Like my heart rate yeah. went down. Oh. I was fine. <laughs> I go, Damn. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The fire department came and they made me sign a consent because they wanted to take me, you know, to the hospital. I said, no, I'm fine. You know, my body just went, but I'm trying to explain to them what I just did and whatnot. Right. Oh but God. that, but that was super scary though. Like, you know what I mean? you've you've just raced like 3000 miles and that last mile you can't even move right you know so yeah i mean like i said there is no victory speech in race across america till you actually cross that finish line it reminds me of that triathlon finish in in the 90s with the 
oh, two yes. women mm -hmm. both collapsed crawling. and are crawling, like trying right. to beat each other and crawling. It's right. Uh, that, that's right. that's endurance sports. At, yeah. you know? I mean, I would crawl too, but I had to take my bike. Has to come you had to have your bike, right? right? At least they were on the run and they didn't have any <laughs> well, equipment with walking. them. Yeah, I was leaning on my bike. Like nobody really saw that because I didn't want anyone to see this. It's kind of embarrassing, right? But there was kind of, like I said, there was a descent into the finish. So I could kind of roll myself, you know, into the finish line, right? You know, but it was like, I had never experienced anything like that before. The body just completely, it just gave out. It was done. It was yeah. done. You've, uh, you've written a book called No Limits and there's a documentary right. about your life that's it just looks so exciting. And, and of course, just from your conversation with you today, I can see how it must be fascinating. It's also called No Limits. Correct. You, you wrote, and I think it's in, maybe in the book, is that the law, and I'm quoting, the long repetitive days allowed my normally racing thoughts to subdue just enough to let my conscious brain hear what's really important. My own inner voice finally told me what I really needed to hear. What is it that you needed to hear? I think just, you know, I think you're always searching for something, right? You know what I mean? That it's okay just to be, you know, you don't always have to, to aspire to do great things for other people. You have to be happy with what you have and what you can do for yourself. And I think for me, that was the biggest thing is always trying to, to, to have an identity with crazy things that I've done. It was important to me, right? But I had to start realizing that I've got to start doing things for myself and what makes me feel good, not what everybody else needs to see, but what I need to feel. And I think that's kind of what I was aiming for when I'm talking about that. And, and speaking of having an inner voice, do you, do you listen to music? Do you listen to podcasts? What do you do on those many, many hours on the bike during your races? Um, no music, no phone, no TV, especially indoors. I live in Canada, so it's indoor training, right? Nothing. I try to replicate as much as possible what Ram is going to feel like. It's going to be dark and it's going to be boring and it's all you're going to see is road, right? So when I'm training, like I'll do 10 hours indoors in Canada, again, because I live in Canada, our weather's it's snowing outside, so I can't ride mm -hmm. outside. That's how I'll train, right? So I don't use any stimulation because it's not something that I can use in a race. I won't train with it, right? I almost want to make my training more difficult than what the race will feel like. Again, trying to replicate as close as possible is the suffering I'm going to happen in Ram to what, you know, to incorporate that with my personal training that I do at home. Yeah. Ah, that, that the concept of, of, of suffering, we've had a variety of um, conversations about that on the show. And I think most of us try to avoid suffering. I mean, you know, you, it's, it's always a, you know, a conversation why I don't want to do that because it'll hurt too right. much or it'll feel like this or, um, and, and so by and large, I think society avoids hurting and avoids suffering. And then I think maybe you, you don't get the, the, the flip side of that as intensely right. if you, right. If you don't, if you don't experience it, but what do you, what do you love most about suffering? Well, it's funny because for somebody that may be suffering for me, it's not, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not the same. Like when you say suffer, you, you almost have it as a negative, as a mm -hmm. negative experience, right? I don't, to me, that's part of my journey to succeed, to do what I want to do. This is what I have to go through, right? Because truly suffering, right? As if I'm pulling your nails up, that's suffering, that's <laughs> torture, right? You know, <laughs> nobody wants to suffer, but sometimes you have to do things that make you feel uncomfortable and you have right. to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable, comfortable. right? So that's a little bit different, right? Because the end game and the end results, it's worth everything, all the suffering that you, you know, or all the stuff that you had to go through prior to get there. So it's part of the journey and part of what you have to experience. So I don't categorize it as suffering. It's just really hard training and something that I love to do because I know doing that, it's going to help me get closer to what I'm looking for and what my goal is, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there's a, a, a place that you can reach that's, that's right on the other side of suffering where your body is still suffering. And, I, and by suffering, I mean, you're creating more lactic acid than your body can clear in any given period of time, right? Your heart rate's high, you're, you know, it's, it's, it's your body screaming. Okay, that's enough. Right? Is there an is there another, the other side of that, you know, when you get to that height of suffering, that is a, a, a mental or emotional or a spiritual space that you feel like you enter, I, I'm, I'm only assuming because you rode all the way across America or you yeah, raced, I, mean, I should say, all yeah, across America. For sure. I mean, sometimes you're just aching, right? And I think for me, 
it's not focusing on that ache, right? Because you know, when you're all you're mm-hmm. thinking, oh, my shoulder hurts or my legs hurts, all you're thinking about is that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Is I'm trying to redirect my brain now, right? Onto the road or something else or or how I'm going to tackle that next climb, you know what I mean? So rather than lasering in on that particular mm-hmm. pain or what I'm feeling in, is I'm trying to redirect my brain if that makes any sense, right? And for the most part, I mean, you are going to be incredibly uncomfortable, right? You know, incredibly tired, incredibly cranky, right? But you know that that and so so that's why it's such a mental thing to prepare yourself for those emotions that you're going to experience and again it's to redirect your brain into something else even if it's to relax it for 15 or 10 minutes or whatever it may be it gives you a bit of and then you can focus back on the pain and then redirect it again right so you kind of play mind games with yourself if that makes any sense too it sounds like a skill to me is it yeah is it, i mean is it a skill yeah. that you honed or is did you just come this way I, I just think it's just the way it is, right? Like a lot of times, you know, when I'm training, I don't, oh, I don't want to do another three hours or whatever. But then I think, oh, you'll just so regret it the next day or whatever, and, you'll, and it'll suffer even more, right? You know, it'll just bug you even more. So you just have to remember what you're doing it, why you're doing it, you know? Mm-hmm. And again, it's the outcome at the end, right? You know, the pain and suffering will be worth it. The results at the end, if you do your job and you know what you need to do. But again, I think a lot of us likes to be like to feel comfortable or we don't like to come out of our comfort zone, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, Fortunately, to achieve things, many things that most people want to do, you do have to go out of that comfort zone and you do have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Wow. That's, that's advice that all of us can use, even if we're not mm-hmm. racing across America in 11, in 11 days. I highly recommend your book and your documentary so that you can go even deeper into your life. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Where I'm almost you- uh, frightened to ask what, what are you doing Ram next year? What's next? Are you going to do the, around the world? What that you, I know you're, <laughs> I know you're reaching for more. Well, we're actually going to finish the documentary in probably February or March. And oh, then cool. I'm going to go after another race. It's called the Trans-Siberian. It's in Moscow yes. and it's yeah. a 9,000 kilometer race. And no woman has completed it. So that's kind of on the radar for my next big race. Wow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It was fun. It was really fun. Thank you so much. For those out there that do listen to this podcast on a regular basis, they know that Switch for Good is a nonprofit. And this time of year, well, it's really important for us to raise funds we need to continue our activism and this podcast into 2022. I recently, as in like just a couple of days ago, uh, was so humbled by the generosity of our listeners and our guests, because guess what? We have a matching grant of $10,000 from Miyoko's Cheese. And if you guys haven't heard Miyoko on our podcast, she's episode 65 and it's fabulous. So check that out. We also have another 10K from an anonymous listener of our podcast. So now we have to get to work to raise 20K in the next two and a half weeks so that these matches can be made, right? Because they're only going to match if we if we raise the other, the other part, the other 20K. So just to give you guys a little bit of a window into um, what amounts could help and, and what it would go to, just $25 will help fund a multitude of education programs that we have from ed- educating pediatricians to even just someone who visits our website and wants to um, figure out how to ditch dairy and, and to make the connection between their food and their health. Just 50 bucks will put a spotlight on the negative impact dairy has on communities of color and help fight corporate greed, like we just did with the Starbucks campaign, if y'all saw that. $100 will fund direct advocacy to demand policymakers put the health of our children over corporate interest. So those are just some examples. So if you feel compelled, and if you listen to this podcast on a regular basis and enjoy it, and most importantly, if you are able to donate, we would be so very grateful. You just go to switchforgood.org and click the donate button. It's really easy. Hey folks, okay, back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review, does not need to be long, does not need to be a whole story, just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. 
We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.